Okay, hello everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 13th, 2023. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. We host this meeting on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, U.S. time, or 11 a.m. Pacific U.S. time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications in Discord, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. As I mentioned, there's a notes doc accompanying the meeting. Um, it contains timestamps to go along with the video. So if you uh, view the uh, video on YouTube, you can then use the doc and skip around to find the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. Um, and after each meeting, we'll post a link for next week's meeting notes to the channel on the Discord. And you can check the pinned messages in the CircuitPython dev channel to find the latest notes doc. Uh, we hold the meeting in five parts. The first is community news. Um, the second is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. The third is hug reports. The fourth is status updates. And the fifth is in the weeds. I'll explain each of those as we get to them. All right. So now um, I'll set a timestamp for community news. Let me press the right button. There we go. OK. Um, so there's a bunch of interesting things going on uh, this week in community news. Let's set these headline headings so I can read them more clearly. Um, Pi Day is March 14th, 314. That was the first three digits of Pi. Um, as you, everybody knows what Pi is if you took geometry. Uh, pi Day is an annual opportunity for math enthusiasts to recite the infinite digits of Pi, not all of them talk to their friends about math and eat pie, P-I-E, and you go to pieday.org to find out about that. Pie Day is also a celebration of celebrating Raspberry Pi. You can pull out your favorite pie and have some fun to consider donating to the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, there are links that I, I will update the links that are in the notes doc. I pasted this quickly from the um, newsletter and it lost the, um, it lost the links for the moment. Okay. Um, now, next, another interest, next interesting thing that's coming up is that uh, GitHub will start requiring uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, by now, I hope you all use two-factor authentication on things as vital as GitHub. But if you don't, by the end of 23, you're going to be required uh, to do that. And they'll start rolling this out today, is what it says. Um, Next up, uh, Make uh, Magazine interviews uh, Deborah Ansel, known as Geek Mong Projects. Um, frequent Pythonista Deborah Ansel, Geek Mong Projects on Twitter, talks to Make colon, about the creative process, making blinking projects, and much more. And you can find there's a link to Magazine there. And finally, another very interesting thing uh, in this week's newsletter is that. Um, about using CircuitPython in neuroscience. Embedded, the Embedded.fm podcast talks to Peter Griffin in episode 444 about operant boxes, projects, embedded systems, and more. At uh, the 29 minute 30 second mark, Peter talks about using CircuitPython in operant box programming. And there'll be links to that if you'd like to find out more about it. So where did all this news come from? It comes from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday, uh, edited by uh, the great Ann Barella. The complete 
archives are available at a link in the notes doc. It, this newsletter highlights the latest Python and hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. We'd love to have you contribute things to this newsletter. You can make a PR to the newsletter PR, uh, repo. There's a link to that. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or Mastodon, or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Any of those are fine. Thank you. All right. Um, next up is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Um, this is a uh, quantitative view of the entire project. It gets us gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from uh, the qualitative stuff that we talk about in status reports. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the CircuitPython core, the libraries, and Blinka. Okay, um, overall in the past week, 34 pull requests were merged by 24 authors. There's a lot of people I don't recognize. Madame Maciek, um, let's see, Zeno Morpheus, Iden is Idenid Zera, uh, Mathjus NL, and maybe some others I've also mispronounced. Um, there were eight reviewers, and there were 14 closed issues by eight people and 16 open by 13 people. Um, so that's um, interesting. And so we're not quite keeping up, but that's okay. People are finding things to fix. Okay, Scott, would you be able to read the core? Yeah, totally happy to. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, so for the core, we had 18 pull requests merged from 13 different authors. So thank you to all of our authors. Uh, we have four reviewers. Um, so thank you to our reviewers. We have 32 open pull requests, which is, again, a little bit above <laughs> where my threshold is. <laughs> I'd like them to fit on the same page. Um, a bunch of those are drafts uh, and unfortunately do get counted towards the, uh, the number that shows up on uh, the top of the page. Um, so if folks have any boards that they'd like to help out with, uh, please take a look at those. I think a lot of those are, are board additions. Um, issues wise in the core, we had nine closed issues by four people and five open by five people. So we're net down four, which is uh, not always the case. So uh, good work in the core folks. Um, we have 634 total open issues um, and we have eight active milestones. Um, we have no open issues for 8.0.x, which is great. Um, but we have nine open for 8.1. Uh, so those are the kind of two most urgent things. And then we have uh, an even 500 open issues on the long-term category. Uh, we have two issues not assigned to Milestone, so we'll have to take a look at uh, getting those triaged and assigned to the appropriate bucket. And, and I should note that uh, these, these milestones are generally used uh, for us who are funded by Adafruit to prioritize uh, CircuitPython work. Um, if other folks want to work on something that may be marked long term, that's still welcome and we're happy to support you doing that. Um, so don't, don't be afraid to pick up other work, uh, e even if it's not in those uh, hi higher priority milestones for us Adafruit folks. Um, that's it for the core. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, Jeff mm -hmm. has volunteered to read about libraries. Katni's out this week. So thank you, Jeff. Hello. So in the libraries, we had 12 pull requests merged overall by 10 authors and reviews by six reviewers. So thanks to all of those folks. Uh, there is a list of the merged pull requests in the notes document. I'm not going to read that out. Uh, that leaves 39 open pull requests across all of the libraries. Issues wise, there were four closed by four people and 10 open by nine people. So uh, in the libraries, we saw the number tick up a little bit, leaving us 605 open issues. 76 of those are marked good first issues. And that brings me to talk about contributing to CircuitPython. And uh, the place to start, if you're interested in helping us out, is circuitpython.org slash contributing, or just go to our front page and click the link in the banner. So uh, if you're interested, that's where you can find all the open PRs, open issues, and a list of library infrastructure issues. This is a great place to start if you're looking to contribute to CircuitPython for the first time. You can sort the issues by label. So search for good first issue if you're just getting started, or for bug and en or enhancement if you're looking for something a little bit more complicated. We have a guide on contributing to Git and GitHub, and we're always available to help you get started with that. So let us know if you need any assistance. 
Uh, all right, and then I've got just a little bit more data before I hand it back to uh, Dan. We track our PyPI weekly download stats, and last week, across 308 libraries, there were 140,419 PyPI downloads. At the top of the list uh, are such popular libraries as Adafruit Bus Device, Adafruit Requests, NeoPixel. Um, and as far as library updates in the last seven days, there are no new libraries, but we updated two libraries, Mini MQTT, and within the community bundle, uh, a library called Uplot. And that wraps it up for the libraries. Okay, uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, one thing I'll note is that uh, because of a mistake I made, there were no bundle updates for a week. Uh, and so that's being fixed, and the new bundle was just published an hour ago or so. Okay, um, next up is Blinka. Uh, and uh, Melissa, could you read that section? Uh, yeah, uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And um, this week we had, <coughs> sorry, uh, four pull requests merged by three authors and uh, one reviewer. Uh, there are four open pull requests at the moment. Um, there was one closed issue by one person, one open by one person, uh, leaving a net of 96 open issues. There were 13,037 PyPI downloads in the last week and uh, 9,591 PyWheels downloads in the last month. And we are at 101 boards. And that's it. Okay, thank you, uh, Melissa. Okay, next section is Hug Reports. Um, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. Uh, if you're text only or missing the meeting, but you have Hug Reports uh, in the notes document, I'll read them off as I get to you in the list. So I'll start. Um, first, thanks to TAC for helping uh, updating Tiny USB, which is uh, something I'm doing at the moment. And uh, he answered some questions of mine, fixed a bug, and also uh, I had some problems with the RP2040 update, and he knew immediately what to do this morning. And so I should be finishing that soon. And thanks to Greg Neverov, who's, uh, we had uh, some extensive, more extensive discussions about Async I.O., and he's doing rework of the Async I.O. library and the internals and has some PRs that we now have to study in detail. Okay, uh, next up is um, Foamy Guy. All right, uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, Hug Reports this week, uh, thank you to um, Nierdoc and Jose David, uh, who both put in some fixes in the display text library. Um, Echoing what you said about G. Neverov uh, for jumping into all of these async I.O. improvements. And then a hug report for Brent Yi, uh, who is, I think, a first-time contributor or perhaps an uh, infrequent contributor, who submitted some typing fixes uh, in one of the libraries this week. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, now we've got Jeff. Hello. Um so I first wanted to thank Microdev for working on the RP2040 watchdog pull request. Uh, I was absolutely sure that the hardware wouldn't do uh, what that PR adds, and I'm happy I was wrong, and that I checked on my facts before I commented on the pull request. Uh, thanks to Mark for continuing to work on the on-disk GIF memory problems, even if there's not a full resolution yet. Dan, I know there's something I wanted to thank you for, but I couldn't figure out what it was, uh, so consider yourself thanked anyway. And uh, finally, to Naradoc for fixing a problem that I ran into with a multi-line label that had blank lines. Okay, thank you, Jeff, and you're welcome for whatever it is. <laughs> okay, uh, Jerry is next up in Hug Report. Hug Report. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks to Maker Melissa for the uh, CircuitPython installer. I, I didn't even know it was a thing and just stumbled across it this, uh, I guess last night when I was trying to update a uh, ESP32 V2, and it worked great. And uh, what a nice tool. So thanks for getting that out there. All right. Thanks. Yes, it's on circuitpython.org. So everybody take a look there. It's it's brand new, really. Um, next up is Jose David. And I'll read uh, their contribution. Um, 
Thanks to Idanizera Danizerda for adding the parameters for 2200 milliamp hour cylindrical batteries in the LC709 203F driver, and for keeping the good vibes along the way, counting pixels in the graph. Yes, this was the data for this was was done by reading a printed graph and looking at the screenshot. So uh, we figured out maybe what the number should be. Thanks to Xenomorpheus for updating an example in the BNO08X library. Thanks to Chris Wilk for adding real-time playback feature to the DRV2605. And thanks to Neradoc for working in fixing the directional option on label and bitmap label. And uh, next up for Hug Reports is DJ Devon3, who is not here, looks like. Okay, so I'll read it. Um, Thanks to Toddbot for an excellent helper function to replace the mix, missing Python find all regular expression that doesn't exist in CircuitPython. I don't know if that one is in your tips and tricks, but it definitely should be, and I'll make sure to check there first next time. Thanks to Narodoc and Deshipu for teaching me how to add list integers using sum with for loops and for teaching me far more efficient JSON parsing techniques. You're both wizards. Thanks to Dan H. for helping me troubleshoot a Metro M7 issue, which ultimately ended up being a bad magnetic data cable and user error. Yes, these magnetic cables are very nice, but you might need to clean the contacts occasionally. Thanks to Jepler for the great guide on the IMX series bootloader. I'm sure it would have worked if I had had a good cable. Thankfully, ended up not needing the guide. The Metro M7 bootloader process is a completely different experience than any other CircuitPython board I've used, used so far. I'm glad the guide was there just in case. And thanks to Lady Ada for, for an excellent episode of Desk of Lady Ada going over the difference between RPSMA and SMA antennas. I made the exact mistakes she warned about, and I'll be correcting my RFM95 antenna connection this week. All right, and next up is Keith the EE text only. Um, thanks to Katni and Tammy Makes Things and Janine over the Python Discord for all helping me during a Build a Text Scrolling Hat workshop. Katni gave me a lot of advice leading up to it, and with Tammy Makes Things, the two helped answer questions in the chat, many of which I did not have the answers for myself, helping me focus on keeping the build moving. Okay, and now uh, maker Melissa is up next in Hug Reports. Hello, um, I wanted to give a hug to Jepler for sharing your chat GPT code, um, to Jerry for testing out the CircuitPython installer, and a group hug to everyone else. Okay, thank you. Next up, I'll read Mark Gamblers, who's uh, out this week. Uh, thanks to Dan H., Tanut, and G. Neveroff for comments and information to get my JTAG debugging going and thoughts on an issue where memory isn't being freed by the garbage collector when I think it should be. Um, and Scott is next up. Thanks, Dan. Uh, first, a hug report to Robert HH, uh, kind of within the, the MicroPython sphere, for running the Perfbench um, programs on the IMXRT with MicroPython for me, uh, using that as a comparison. Um, hug report to Dan H for chatting with me while I'm in the performance weeds uh, at the end of last week. It, a lot of random stuff and it, it was help, helpful to talk it through and uh, decide on a direction to go from there. Um, and lastly, not related to CircuitPython, but um, Adam from the Albums app. Uh, anybody listens to albums more than songs uh, should check it out. Uh, it works on top of Apple Music, which is really neat. Um, and they let me nerd snipe them about importing Spotify song playback history. Um, they do last.fm imports already, but uh, I didn't always have it working with my Spotify. So thanks to them for, for entertaining me and, and humoring me on that. Okay, thanks, Scott. And finally, uh, t this week, Tetric, who's not present, but has a group hug. All right. Uh, next up is status updates. Um, Status updates is our time to sync up on what we were doing. I'll start and we'll go through the list alphabetically. Um, when I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. Uh, this is also an opportunity to provide trick tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. And if we get into a discussion in status updates, we can move that to in the weeds for a more extended discussion. 
All right, so I will start. Um, so uh, in the past week or so, I've been working on updating uh, various pieces of software that we depend that CircuitPython depends on. Uh, I'm doing this for 810 um, because it, these are mostly upward compatible changes are in all cases really, and so uh, at least to the outside user, so that's all right. Um, so I updated the Pico SDK to the latest version and the CYW43 driver. The CYW43 is the module that's on the Pico W that does Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but we don't have Bluetooth support yet. So I updated them to the latest version. They seem to work okay. And I'm nearly done updating TinyUSB, which we were about a year behind on. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, TAC has been helping me on that, particularly on the RP2040. So that should be in soon as well. I'm still planning to do uh, 804 and 810 beta 1 releases soon, like maybe this week. There's a lot of reviewing just to keep up with everything that might go over those releases and helping others debug issues to get uh, fixes into those releases. And as Scott mentioned, I talked with him about IMX performance late last week. Okay, uh, next is uh, DJ Devon 3, and I'll read his. Um, added some NeoPixels to my male boombox project. It now blinks and plays a sound on the 20 watt speakers when receiving a LoRa test message for mailbox activity. It is so bright and loud you can't ignore it. It could easily be adapted as a great accessibility project for deaf or blind. Created a STEM. A Steam API example for the Adafruit request library. Unlike most popular websites, Steam does not use OAuth. I like the way Steam does it. It's the easiest API I've used so far. Creating an API key is a one-click process. The data you can return is minimal. They put their users' privacy first, which I find highly respectable. The API example pulls every game you've played into a list. It then adds all of the time played into a sum total in hours or days spent playing video games. If you've played a lot of Steam games over your lifetime, you might not want to see that number. It's another popular API ad added to the library. Okay, and then received the Metro M7 this week. After realizing I don't have a large dot clock display, I ordered the seven inch display from Adafruit. I plan to dive into a graphical project when that arrives. And uh, Foamy Guy is next up for status updates. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, I had a bit of a lighter week last week. I was on vacation for the second half of the week, all the way through the weekend. Um, the stuff that I did get into, though, is I started working on a fix inside Boundary Fill, uh, which is inside the Bitmap Tools module in the core. It was not handling background tasks or respecting the Control-C interrupt, so th those things are now in there. Uh, but there is a bit of a hiccup on the actions for the Unix port that I'll need uh, so point in the right direction on if I can get. Um, the other thing I did last week, uh, more on a, a for fun type of a note, is um, I saw this viral video of a person playing a MIDI piano in order to draw a picture inside of the like DAV software that was recording the notes. So they played a song in order to have it draw that picture. Um, and I can't really play the piano, uh, but I do know CircuitPython, and I made a script that will import a bitmap image, a small uh, one-bit image, and then out put MIDI notes over the USB that correspond to that drawing uh, if you're recording it inside of the software. Uh, so you can kind of make your own pictures in there. It's been interesting to listen to different um, images, uh, albeit not necessarily practical and sometimes more chaotic than musical, uh, but a lot of fun to play with. Uh, this week, a couple of things that I know of so far, uh, I've been reviewing some PRs this morning, tested a couple of fixes for bitmap label, and uh, checked into some typing fixes in the BLE library. Um, the only other thing I know for sure I want to work on this week uh, is attempting to add an endpoint to the web workflow API to return the information about the storage, like how much space there is and how much of it's used. Uh, there's an issue or maybe, yeah, I guess probably issue 7637 where that's discussed. Um, but I haven't really gotten fully dove back in yet, so I'm sure some other stuff will pop up throughout the week. Um, that's what I got. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I just want uh, the MIDI uh, piano picture thing. I there's another video which I may have posted about, which is somebody having fractals, which they then translated to MIDI notes, which actually makes for some interesting, pleasing music. 
which is kind of interesting. Okay, uh, next up is Jeff. Hello. Uh, so last week I wrote a guide called Infinite Text Adventure or Infinite Zork. It runs on a Pi portal of any of the three sizes and uses ChatGPT to create an infinite, if sometimes nonsensical, text adventure. You can customize it by writing in plain English or even French rather than computer code, uh, which is really neat. Uh, I worked. I started working on the I2S out for the IMX series of microcontrollers. It is at the point where it doesn't build yet. I will keep working on that this week. And uh, for myself, while playing with ChatGPT, um, I created a text-based front-end to run on your computer and talk to the ChatGPT API and put that up on GitHub and had a lot of fun learning a new library called Textual. Um, yeah, and that's about it. So uh, what's up next is working on I2S out on the IMX microcontrollers. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next, I'll read Jose David's contribution, um, some PR reviews, PR to fix the padding and label after the work done by Narodoc and bitmap label, and uh, not sort of Python, help translate game messages for the open source tabletop game. And there's a link to the GitHub repo for that. Okay, and Maker Melissa is up next. Uh, hi. Um, so yeah, I'm reading for the last two weeks because I was out uh, sick for part of last week. I'm not quite better yet, but um, anyway, I finished up getting the CircuitPython installer live and working. I added a bunch of new boards to CircuitPython.org. Uh, I wrote a JavaScript merge bin library to incorporate most of the functionality of ESP tools merge bin function, uh, but it works online. I updated the whippersnapper firmware uploader to be able to create a downloadable file for flashing later, which used the merge bin library. Um, I worked with Brent to fix an issue where whippersnapper sometimes wasn't working on the ESP8266. I wrote a voice assistant Python script that interfaces with chat GPT and runs on the Raspberry Pi. And I tested out the ESP tool JS on different boards. Uh, it worked uh, on most, but uh, wasn't working on the ESP32 S2 that I had tested. Um, this week, I'm working on some changes to allow the CircuitPython installer to be used on the Adafruit Learn system. And I'm also going to work on some additional improvements to the CircuitPython installer. And that's it so far. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next, I'll read uh, Mark Gambler's contribution. Um, PR7712 adds dnit support to on disk GIF. This ended up not fully fixing the memory feeing issue, but it can be treated on its own if it passes review. So um, thanks, Mark. OK, and next up is Scott. Hello, um, I'm in the weeds still uh, for the IMX. Uh, in particular, I'm running a lot of performance benchmarks MicroPython has them. I'm just I'm running them. I got I got them working. There were some fixes I had to do to get them running. So I'll I'll have a PR uh, at some point here soon, hopefully. Um, I mentioned Robert HH sent uh, posted the MicroPython on the IMX tests, and at that point, CircuitPython was running about half the speed that MicroPython was on the IMX, which was uh, quite surprising to me. Um, and I've been digging into what they're doing in MicroPython. This is, uh, and I'm kind of more, much more in the ballpark uh, as, as it was before. It's mostly a function of putting things in ITCM, which is the, the instruction tightly coupled memory. Um, they're pretty aggressive about that. They're also aggressive in using the DTCM, the data TCM, um, which is kind of interesting to me too, but I thought I have to look more about how DMA interacts with that. Um, and then also they use soft FP as the, as the floating point ABI rather than hard. And it looks like that also made a big difference too. I'm going to take a look at that um, again. Uh, I have a couple more things I want to try, kind of big things that I hope we get big wins from. Um, one is we use object representation C by default in CircuitPython, and A is what the default uses in MicroPython. I'm curious to see just how big of an impact that has on performance. So I'm going to take a look at that. That should be pretty quick to, to switch. 
um, that has to do with how small data pieces of data are stored in the pointer itself rather than allocating out to the heap. Um, speaking of the heap, um, the heap generally lives in what's known as OCRAM. I don't remember what it stands for. Um, but it's basically RAM that other peripherals can access as well, so which is really handy for DMA. Um, it runs at a quarter of the speed of the core, so uh, I'm curious as to turning on the cache in front of that and seeing how fast things run if it's cached. Um, the tricky bit with that is that um, anything, any pieces of memory in that range, if you have the cache on, you have to be very deliberate to say, write it out completely or uh, ignore what you have cached based on um, when the other things might be changing or reading that memory. Uh, because if you have the cache, the changes may only live kind of visible to the CPU rather than visible to everything. Um, so that adds complexity, but also could mean that accesses to that will take a single cycle rather than four or more. Um, so I'm going to take a look at that. And then lastly, I found that, um, so Clang is a separate compiler from GCC. Uh, it's really, really commonly used in desktop applications because they, its first claim to fame was that uh, it had better error messages than GCC, but uh, it's also licensed not under GPL. So uh, you see a lot more corporate uh, compiler work happening from Google in particular or Google is one of them, it started at Apple. Uh, but because it's liberally licensed, you see more corporate contributions to uh, LLVM and, and Clang is the C compiler version of that. Um, I wanted to move to that for a long time, but it's not been as good as the ARM GCC version. Um, I found that TI has modified Clang to work better on embedded, in particular respecting linker scripts better. Um, and so I'm, I want to just see if I could use that um, in particular for the IMX so that we could do link time optimization. Um, in GCC, link time optimization may move code from like one memory region to another, even though we're trying to like, the challenge is that sometimes memory regions are not accessible. So if you're like erasing flash, you can't run code from flash because it's busy. Um, and so you have to be careful in putting like all of the code that can run when you're doing flash stuff in RAM. Um, and that's true for RP2040 and also um, ESP. So if we could have a version of Clang that did that and did LTO, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, because link time optimization can, can do more, it, it's smarter because it knows more stuff. Anyway, so I, I want to take a peek at that because this is the first time I, I've seen an alternate thing that could do LTO and, and linker section. So I'm going to take a look at that. And last up, um, it's not circuit Python related, but I'm excited about it. I ended up ordering a Steam Deck, which is um, kind of a handheld gaming computer. Um, think, uh, think Nintendo Switch, but running Linux and pretty open. And they have a bunch of repair stuff through iFixit, which is cool too. So um, I ordered one of those and I'm excited to try it when it gets here. Okay, thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. And finally, I'll read Tetrix. Um, been it out the last couple of weeks between being sick, classes, and my birthday. Registered for PyCon. Excited to be going this year and eager to see everyone there. I also plan to attend the first day of Dev Sprints before heading home. Planning to catch up on PR reviews and keep working on the CI tools using RP2040.js. I'll have more information and topics for discussion in the weeds next week about how the CI tool should analyze and report the information, as well as how it should be configurable. I think that we'd use, we can use pyproject.toml to do so. I'll have an example when I present it. Okay, so expect more, a larger in the weeds next week. And speaking of in the weeds, this brings us to the in the weeds section, which is an opportunity for more long form discussions that either come out of status updates or that folks have identified ahead of time. If you have any in the weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things. So we're not waiting around to see if anyone has topics. Okay, so Jeff has uh, like to talk about uh, Watchdog. Yeah, and it may be better to talk about this on issues or pull requests, uh, since 
Microdev is one of the people involved and they're not in this meeting, but I'll go ahead and talk about this anyway. So Microdev filed a pull request to add the ability to disable the watchdog on RP2040 after it was already enabled. And um, in looking at this further, I feel like there is uh, some inconsistency and I think that it would be great to resolve that. So the first item is the inconsistent behavior across ports and specifically does the watchdog get reset when the interpreter exits. Naradoc says that it does on Espressive and I believe that it should remain active if it's not explicitly uh, turned off even when your program exits such as through an exception. Um, and the reason that I want this is I have an existing project, it's a keyboard, and uh, when you are trying to communicate with the host computer and the USB connection isn't active, you get an exception. And to fix this crashing my keyboard, I just put in the use of the watchdog uh, so that the program will kind of continuously restart until the host computer is ready. Works great. Um, but if the watchdog is turned off by the standard platform reset when the interpreter exits, then that would not occur and my keyboard would uh, break. And because Espressif right now is doing this, advice that I've given people, uh, like on the CircuitPython, help with CircuitPython channel, to enable the watchdog so that after any problem, the device would restart as though from power on, that was wrong advice that I had generalized from these other platforms where there was no way to turn off the watchdog. Uh, so that's part A. I think we need to create a consistent behavior across the ports where if the watchdog is not explicitly disabled, it remains enabled when your program exits. Um, except maybe if you control C it or if there's a reload, I think there's some wiggle room in those cases, uh, but not generally speaking. Second, um, the watchdog code I think was written when the SAMD was the only microcontroller or uh, maybe, maybe the only microcontroller. And it has no way to ever disable the watchdog until there is a reset of the whole system. Uh, so in the shared bindings, there's actually a check for setting the mode back to none, and that is rejected. Um, what Espressive and now RP2040 do is they use a call to the dinit method of the watchdog object to disable the watchdog. And that's kind of inconsistent because normally after you call dinit on an object, that means the object can no longer be used and that is not how it is. So I think we need to allow assigning of none or allow the common how layer to be the one that throws the exception if it's not supported by the hardware. Um, and then because it doesn't make sense to de-init the watchdog, we would remove that API from nine or from some future version of CircuitPython. Uh, that's my brain dump. Any comments? I think that's good. I think it'll be interesting to see if you can get consistent behavior across all the platforms or just say, okay, this is not supported. Ideally, the API is this, but blah, 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 is not supported. So I think that makes sense. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I think you're, I think you're on the right track as well, because we just didn't have enough experience of the differences in all the platforms. Um, I did see somewhere that Deshipu pitched the idea of a uh, like a Circuit Python watchdog, um, an all which, software kind of thing, an all software sort of thing, yeah. Which I think could also be interesting, and you should think about when when redoing this, um, because then then that solves the problem if the if the actual hardware can't um, be disabled. If we had a software watchdog kind of like as a first like as a python watchdog then then that could be interesting to, like that could be a way to to have one that you could actually disable mm. um which i think could be interesting so i i'm not saying we have to add it but i think it's something i think you're right that we need to to think holistically about it and and, and evolve it and i think that's something to consider uh, when when thinking about how to evolve it is is whether we want a, a pure Python sort of watchdog. 
because that would be that that'll be way easier to make consistent across ports. Yeah. I mean, Do you, having the it, hardware watchdog is good too for hangups in circuit pipe. Yeah, but maybe we use that internally just to make sure that our checking code is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, we could use the hardware watchdog to ensure that our software watchdog isn't <laughs> is still working. If, if we can't turn it, but if we can't turn it off, that's a problem too. So, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think once we start looking at watchdog, we'll discover there are more things that we want. So, for instance, uh, I think. I may have closed based on incorrect information um, an issue which said on the RP2040, please disable the watchdog during a flash write. Um, you know, a user was running into problems that during the flash write, the watchdog would fire, and mm -hmm. then your, your circuit pie is in a really bad state. And mm -hmm. because I thought that the RP2040 watchdog could not be disabled, like at the hardware level, um, I yeah. think I may have posed that issue saying this, that would be great, but actually it's not possible. So I should go look for that. Uh, the other thing I will do as an action item out of this is go uh, open an issue which says, um, kind of basically restates what I said here. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, ask for it to be worked on. And I think it would be nice if we could put that in 8.1, but I also wouldn't hold 8.1 for this. Um, I, it feels like a 9.0 like API change to me. Removing DNA, yes. Um, changing it so that you can assign none to the watchdog mode property, yeah. depending on the yeah, um, d depending on whether it's hardware supported, it doesn't seem that big a a change. But right. there's more. I think as we think about it, you're right that there's more, like kind of a full rethink of watchdog. Yeah, and the other th the other case I just ran into was that on the Bangle JS two, the bootloader enables the watchdog, and the NRF can't turn it off. So I actually needed to add code in CircuitPython to feed the watchdog, um, which would be similar to if we use the hardware watchdog internally and then mm -hmm. had a software watchdog for user code on top of that. All right, so we just need to bring that code up to a more generic. Level does it run off background tick or something else? Uh, yeah, I added this like it runs every background task call. Okay, it's a really aggressive. Even even though I know like I know the period of the hardware watchdog is like five seconds or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't want to add complexity to like figure out when I actually needed to feed it. So just feed it every time. All right, thanks all. Okay. Yeah, thanks thank for thinking you. about that. All right. So uh, we'll finish up. Um, this has been the Circuit Python Weekly for um, March thirteenth, twenty twenty three. Thanks to everybody who participated. Reminder that if you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python and those of us that work on Circuit Python, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. We'll release this uh, video, this meeting on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. There'll also be a link in tomorrow's Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. The next meeting will be held next Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, in the U.S., that's daylight time. Um, and in in other part in other northern hemisphere countries, maybe you will or will not have switched to daylight savings time by then. I think not. I think it's a little later. So a reminder that add yourself ads to be added to the at at science circuit Pythonistas uh, role on Discord if you want notifications of that. So thank you everyone, and we'll see you next week. I will stop recording.